Hello. Hey, how's it going? Good, good, and you? Good, yeah. Uh, good. I am very excited because my cat is doing well after his surgery and I got to pick him up today. Oh, okay, that's, that's very good. Yeah, he's going to be so sad when he gets home. He's going to do a big sad meow, I bet. <laughs> um, anyway, hey, y'all, welcome in. So yesterday I went over by about 20 minutes, so today I'm going to go under by about 25 minutes. And just so y'all know, like, if you're used to your high school teachers going over, I totally didn't mean to. Uh, I just lost track of the time because I wasn't looking at a correct clock. Uh, the clock in my office on the wall, apparently the battery is dead. So no matter what time it actually is, when I look at it, it's the top of the hour. Um, in high school, man, you might totally have a teacher who's like, hey, you have to stay. I have a couple more minutes of garbage to put on the board before I let you go. Um, Exactly the same as like when y'all go to college, don't be that kid who shows up in college and is like, could I go to the bathroom? Because it will get a chuckle from everybody in the room who's old and knows what's up, right? Um, once you go to college, you're an adult, you're completely autonomous. Another adult cannot force you to be in a place at a time. Uh, that's called kidnapping. So if I ever go overtime and next year when you're in college, if your college professor goes over time and you don't want to listen or hang around for what they have to say, it is absolutely within your power to just pack your bag up quietly and leave. And whether or not you do that is up to you. It might be deemed as rude or whatever, but like more often than not, if a professor, if that class ends at 15 after and the professor is talking at 18 after, nah, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm cool. Um, so what I'm saying is like, fight me. Like if I go over time, one, tell me. And two, you don't have to take that from your college professors, especially since there's like the weird chance that I am one of your college professors next year. That's some like straight up Harry Potter level nonsense of like, oh, I knew this dude before he taught this class and now he's teaching this class. Um, did I, I told y'all I'm applying a PCC and GCC to teach, right? Yeah, yeah, you said yes. it. Oh, word, okay, yeah. So I don't know if that would be good or bad or whatever, but it might happen. Um, item one, update those stock values uh, just because, you know, you know, we're doing this every day for a couple weeks. And just so y'all are forewarned, um, on Friday, I'm going to have y'all upload the week two update. I'm going to give it a grade, and I'm going to look through and make sure that you've been keeping up with the equations and with movements in your um, holdings to use the, like, parlance um, and what I want you to do today on top of just doing your edit is in the do nows that y'all like write down on paper or whatever, find a stock that has some price movement, right? So find a stock that has gone up or down and try and figure out why. So go to a news source that you find reputable or when you're looking for financial stuff, people tend to rely on financial news, but I think that that gives all of that news like the same slant, like people tend to use Bloomberg or Forbes or business insider or whatever to look for investing price. But I, in my head, I'm always like, well, if everybody's looking at the same investing news for information, doesn't that mean that everybody's going to invest the same? Uh, that stuff weirds me out. But nonetheless, find one of your stocks that goes up or down and try and look up a news article that rationalizes why. Kind of like yesterday when at the top of the hour we talked about Moderna and the fact that they had blown up over the weekend. And that was due to the fact that they had landed a $280 million grant to assist with their research. And that's what led to all of the uh, after hours price movement. And then uh, item number two, I think this was a question that Alan asked uh, that I wanted to answer for everybody. Um, and the thing that I'm about to say, I have to put a bunch of disclaimers on it because one, I guess I'm about to endorse or push you towards a product. But I want to say up top that one, this is not an advertisement or endorsement of this product. It's just that this is a very specific problem. And to solve this very specific problem, there's like one source that people use. Uh, it's like the one tool I've seen for it. So if you're doing a lot of gig work or you're self-employed, it means that you're going to collect up a ton of 1099s. So when I do my income and my taxes at the end of the year, yo, I have one or two W-2s at most. I got the W-2 from AGBU and I got the W-2 from teaching at Cal State LA. Under the income in my taxes, I enter the few boxes from those two. It takes like three or four minutes total, right? And that's all my income for a year. But if you're a musician or if you're editing or if you're writing or if you're doing graphic design, 
over the course of a month, you might have four or five projects, which means you might have 50 or 60 projects by the end of the year, right? That means that when you type all that junk in, there's as much information on a 1099 as there is on a W-2. You will spend 50 times as much time inputting all of your income into your taxes than somebody who works just one regular job. So I asked my homie who's a musician and uh, editor, he teaches at USC and he does like editing work on the side, like what he uses. Um, this company that makes TurboTax is called Intuit, I-N-T-U-I-T. And um, the reason why I have to put a disclaimer on me telling you that this thing exists is the simple fact that uh, Intuit is kind of, I don't want to say it's a scam or say it's exploitative, but basically the whole deal with TurboTax is for 50 bucks, they give you a website that helps you file your taxes, but filing your taxes on your own isn't that hard. And if you do it on your own without their tools, you save that 50 bucks. Um, and there's a lot of people who take issue with the way that TurboTax operates, even though it's like one of the most popular uh, services. Um, nonetheless, the same company uses a app called QuickBooks. Uh, it's an app on your phone that you have to pay for. If you spend a little bit of time Googling around, it's one of those things where uh, podcasts have advertisements for it. So if you look for a QuickBooks coupon code, you can probably find one that will give you like five or 10 bucks off through the year or whatever. And all that it is, is it's an app on your phone that whenever you get a 1099, you could take a picture of it and it'll store the information in it. And if you uh, do your taxes at the end of the year, all you have to do is uh, give the person preparing your taxes, your QuickBooks account, and it will automatically have all of your 1099s for the year stored, categorized, sorted, and added up so that at the end of the year, doing your taxes isn't a nightmare. Um, now, I'm not saying that this is the best tool or that this is the only tool, but this seems to be the most common tool for keeping track of hella 1099s. Um, is that okay, Alan? Does that answer your question from yesterday? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, and good luck out there, you know. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and edit up our stock prices, and then I'll take um, any questions or comments that y'all have. I want to get a couple of these from the crowd about what stocks you have that other people might not have, what price movements you see in them, and see if you can rationalize it with an article. Now, keep in mind that a lot of these price movements um, are not necessarily driven by humans. A lot of this stuff is computers trading with computers. So sometimes price fluctuations happen for literally no reason, or sometimes the wrong reasons, like with uh, how Anne Hathaway getting a new acting gig can affect the price of Berkshire Hathaway simply because Twitter bots recognize the word Hathaway and move stock prices around. Um, so just because the stock moves doesn't mean that there's like a good reason or a rationale to it. Uh, but Oftentimes, we can find a reason why a stock has moved a certain amount or not. So like always, I'm going to go to my uh, sample project, and I'm going to um, do my daily update so that y'all can follow along at home. I duplicate it down, change the date to 4.19. Uh, this time, I'm going to start off by typing in yesterday's stock value. So yesterday, my total investments were 11,642 cents. Hey, which is pretty good, right? If this was my actual portfolio, after five days, I've uh, made an extra 1600 bucks off that 10,000. I'm gonna put that in my new box for yesterday's value, 11,600.42. And like I'm always yelling, this is gambling. It's not guaranteed that you put money in the stock market and your numbers go up. This is just coincidental. as we're about to see. Uh, so yeah, 2323.95, lost money there. Oh no, lost money on Novavax. Lost money on Sony. Ah, lost money on Google. 
all of my stock prices dropped today. Yup. Yeah, to same here. Welcome to I investing, lost, gang. I lost seven percent. Market is crashing. <laughs> Yeah, everything's crap. Welcome, welcome to investing, y'all. The best lesson I could ever teach you. So I'm down ten. I'm down ten percent from yesterday. Mr. Um, Robinson. However, I'm still up from my initial investment, right? Because we started by tossing in ten thousand dollars. So even though we're down from yesterday, I'm still up three hundred and seventy dollars. Uh, what's up? Could could I sell all my stocks and keep the money as cash on hand until like a different day where I want to invest? Um, you know, that is also part of investing. If you want to cash out, if you want to say, hey, all of these numbers are now zero, right? My quantities, I'm going to sell all of them off, change them all to zero, cash out, and then keep the cash in my account until it, it's smarter to reinvest it. You may absolutely do that. Just keep track of it. Um, the only thing you can't do is that, like, if I had magical knowledge of the future, if I could, like, cheat the stock market, I should have sold yesterday, right? Yeah. If I sold yesterday, I would have been able to pocket this $1,000 gain, and then I would have had this to reinvest if I thought the market was going to uh, get punched in the face today the way that it seems to be. Um, but if you are here and you are like, okay, things are in decline, I'm going to sell off, have that cash, and reinvest it when things get better, you could totally do that because um, you, know, you buy low, sell high, so if yesterday was a market high, you sell, hold the cash until a market low, and then buy a bunch more stock than you had before. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and I mean, th this is a project. This is, for example, there's no correct answer as to how to invest. I would consider that in real life to actually be irresponsible. That's like some day trading stuff. For the most part, you want to pick short bets and invest over long periods of time. But I don't know, this stuff's pretty volatile right now. Uh, was everybody able to get their stocks updated? Yeah, but uh, I can't find an article explaining like why any of my stocks dropped. I searched up for each individual stock too. Um, um, hmm. Nothing? Yeah, like nothing at all. Like everything was just like from February. Nothing now. Uh, I guess that one with Moderna was like kind of a... Um, gamble. Uh, it was a gamble to bet on Moderna, but also finding that article that supported why its prices went up so much overnight last night. Um, but I mean, I did hear something that... um they were like releasing the hydrochloroquine, like hydrochloroquine, I think that's what it's called, like all across uh, all the coronavirus patients. Maybe that's why, because Moderna didn't find anything and it was already found. Uh, be, like, no, hi, no, no. Okay, so one, Moderna's working on a vaccine and a vaccine is made of the virus and designed so that um, uh, it stops you from getting sick. Hydrochloroquine is unrelated because that's being proposed as a treatment to the disease once you already have it. Mr. Oh, okay. And uh, hydrochloroquine is an anti-malarial drug that we already knew about. And malaria mm -hmm. is a parasite that lives in your liver if you get it from a mosquito bite. Um, mm -hmm. And the testing to see whether or not it's effective at treating coronavirus is still super early. And the bummer is that like time feels really slow right now because we're all stuck at home. But in reality, doing clinical testing to see if a drug treats a disease can take months for people to like do and then do the math on to see if it was valid. The one bonus is that we know that hydrochloroquine is safe as long as you um, do it in certain doses and monitor its delivery. Like all drugs are dangerous if you overdose, but there's already safety testing done for hydrochloroquine. So they're able to jump straight to efficacy testing in a clinical trial, which is being worked on right now by like five or six major universities. Yeah, okay. I got you. Mr. 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 Rob? Uh, what's up? You go ahead, Jack. Uh, is Amazon stock prices falling because of the protest by the workers, or is that over? Um, the protest for the workers is definitely still going on, and it's part of why uh, Amazon Prime delivery times have dropped so uh, low. Like, it's taking me two weeks to get a set of screwdrivers that I need to fix my wife's laptop. 
Um, but I actually have a bigger reason why all of the stock prices are in free fall. I was surprised that none of y'all saw this the other day, but um, it'll give me a chance to talk about a couple different topics before we get back to lecture. What's up, Alan? Uh, do you support vaccines? Just wanna, cause I, a lot of people I know don't support vaccines because you put the virus in, inside your body. Um, that's a really wild question to be asked of somebody in the year uh, 2020. Okay, yeah, sure, right? Um, you could get it done quicker than that, but it would require that basically the researchers work with the FDA and the FDA works with the researchers. Um, but overall, once a vaccine is even developed, no, it'll still probably take about 12 months to get out there. Just because like in biology, have y'all ever grown anything in a Petri dish? Do you remember doing stuff like that? Have you guys ever grown something in a Petri dish? No. Um, no. So you take uh, agar, right? It's basically food that bacteria likes to grow on. And you literally grow the bacterial colony. And just like having a garden, like there's nothing I can do in my garden to make my beans grow faster, man. It's just biology takes time. It's required. And because part of the vaccine itself is biological, you literally need to take the virus and grow it in vats in order to increase the amount you have so that that can then be used to create the vaccines. And the act of creating a vaccine, you literally have to grow one of the ingredients. It's not just like you do a bunch of chemical reactions and now you have the molecule you want. So the act of growing the live part of the vaccine, that is time consuming. And then getting it distributed around the world is also time consuming. So I think the over under on, hey, Here's the day where we have uh, a vaccine in the lab and it's ready to go and it works to, hey, the world is vaccinated now. That whole time scale is probably about a year. Mr. Rob? Yes. Do you think there's going to be like a, another viral outbreak since people aren't getting vaccinated like for measles or chicken pox right now? Um, that's an interesting thing. Uh, I wouldn't worry about also, chicken pox. If you're vaccinated for chicken pox, you should be vaccinated for life. Should be. And this is coming from somebody who had chicken pox twice in his life, which is why I try and stay away from uh, the children of hippies. But um, it's really important to keep in mind that one of our best examples of this is the Spanish flu from 1920, um, which if you don't know about is kind of the last time there was a global pandemic. Uh, of this scale. Though, of course, it's not super comparable just because technology is different. So on one hand, our medical technology is way better than it was in the 1920s. But on the other hand, so is our transportation technology. Our airplanes kick ass compared to how people got around the world back then. So our airplane systems are one of the biggest things that drove the virus around the world as quickly as it was sent around the world. So we have these competing forces. It's really hard to compare what's going on now directly to the Spanish flu. But here's one lesson from the Spanish flu. More people died in the second wave than died in the first wave. Because once people thought it was over, they started having parades in the summer. Not to mention there was the ending of a war. So there were also parades for the soldiers returning home. That caused a second outbreak, which killed way more people than the first wave did. If I were you, I would look up Spanish flu second wave for more information. Wait, so Mr. Robbins, you know, you just said you got it twice. Um, yeah. I've also heard that. Once you get a virus once and then like your body overcomes it, it kind of like learns how to beat it. So you don't, you can, you don't really get it again ever after that. So that's what immunology is. That's what being immune to anything is. And that should be true of all disease. But just like anything in a bi biological textbook, you have to keep in mind that that stuff is the norm. And that norm is not true for all creatures. So like the human average body temperature is what, 97 point something for you, right? And even that basic fact isn't true for me. So the average human body temperature is 97.7 degrees Fahrenheit. So people think when they check a thermometer that if the number is above that, they have a fever. Yo, my body temperature is always 98.5. Like I just run hot as a human being. So even that fundamental biological fact isn't true for me. Normally, after you have a disease, you should become immune to it because you have um, antibodies in your bloodstream permanently, which are stored by the immune system, so that if you get sick again, they're like, hey, we've dealt with this before. We know how to kill this thing. Quickly deploy the immune system to go deal with it. And the whole point of a vaccine is it stimulates that response. It lets your body develop antibodies, but without the downside of being sick. 
So you get the measles vaccine, we put measles antibodies in you so that if you ever get exposed to the measles, your body can automatically defend from it. But you get the immunity without having to go through measles. For whatever reason, like I have an all right immune system, like my wounds heal and I get sick once or twice a year at most and it's all fine. But yeah, for whatever reason, man, I had chicken pox when I was a kid, so I didn't end up getting the vaccine afterwards. And then I got chicken pox again in college. I just got bad luck or the disease mutated enough so that my immune system didn't recognize it the second time I got it. Because like technically, every time you get the flu, you become immune to that strain of flu. But the reason why you get the flu again and again and again and again is that it mutates and then your immune system doesn't recognize it when it comes back around. Sorry, and then my other question was um, about, you said it would be like, if they find the vaccine, they'll they'll be able to like get it out faster because obviously because of the situation right now. But what's the fastest you think, like a year you said? Um, for it to be available to you, probably about a year. Yeah, just because once they start limited production of it, I guarantee you the first people it goes to is healthcare providers. So it'll go to doctors, nurses, anybody who has to work in a hospital first to make sure that the workforce that deals with people who get sick is unaffected. Then it'll start going out to people. Um, it's going to go out to people based on importance and going out to the general public is going to be the last place it goes. So you could rush production of a small batch, get it out in six months. I guarantee it's going to be for doctors and nurses only. So no matter what is regular old civilians who are capable of staying at home in these times, we're last on the list. Okay, for sure. Uh, these are all good questions and all valid because this whole part of the class, I would assert, is basically like how to be an adult. And these are good questions to think about as an adult operating in the world. Is there anything else before we get back to um, lecture? Yeah, Mr. Rob, I have a question. Yeah. Do you think the vaccines increase like uh, cancer, like lung cancer, breast cancer, skin cancer? Um, if... If there was evidence of that, there would be evidence of that. Yeah, true. Like a big part of, of testing is that you do right all now, sorts of safety testing where you send a drug out there into the world. And if that was true, you would see a higher cancer rate amongst people who were vaccinated versus people who are unvaccinated, which there is a subgroup of people out there who are unvaccinated. Uh, just because there are certain diseases or you can be immunocompromised in certain ways that make it so that you can't get vaccines. And so we have a population of people with vaccines, a population of people without vaccines. And if vaccines caused some effect, you would be able to see that difference in those two groups. And I don't believe that evidence exists, at least not high quality scientific evidence. That evidence yeah. tends to just come from Facebook posts. I just read something from the Spanish flu and uh, coronavirus, like to compare it, but uh, it was only smokers that got lung cancer. So I ain't finished reading, so it's my fault. Um, okay. Today we're going to talk about the marginal tax rate, which we are picking up from yesterday, because yesterday um, we talked about what paperwork it is that you want to set aside in order to be able to do your taxes. It's a long list of boring stuff, but it's important stuff, man, because honestly, doing your taxes isn't that hard if you pay a tax preparer or if you, um, oh wait, I'm sorry. I said I would end early today, but that, what does that have us ending at if we end early? Makes it the top of the hour, right? So I only have 10 minutes left. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we'll end at the top of the hour today, so we'll end in 10 minutes. So let's talk real quickly, and I guess I'll drag this out into one other day. So if you are a person who reads the OWS, know that everything's going to get shifted down one. Today, we're going to talk about marginal tax rate. So this is the answer to the question, how much are you actually going to be taxed? So how much are you taxed based on your income? Now, the system that we use in order to um, determine the tax rate is complicated, like it is kind of unnecessarily complicated, but the point of that is to attempt to create a fair tax system or a fairer tax system where effectively 
the design of a marginal tax rate system is the more you make in income, the more you pay. This is one thing that it obeys. So the more you make, the more you make, the more you pay. Mr. Rob, do you think it should be like that or should it be a flat tax? Oh, it definitely should not be a flat tax because if it's a flat tax, then rich people end up paying less than poor people simply because poor people by percent have to spend more of their money. If you're poor, you spend all of your money on rent and food, which means all of your income that is taxed has to go back out into the world. If rich people were taxed the same amount, then the they spend less of their income on living and the rest of that money can just go sit in a savings account and not get reinvested back into the economy. By having rich people pay more, it basically just guarantees that all of this money stays in the economy. It stays moving around instead of being locked down in savings accounts offshores. But do you think it's okay to pass, like surpass 50%? Um, I'm not going to get into my political beliefs on this topic. I'm just going to do the math. Um, so number one, the goal of the marginal tax here is to figure out exactly how much you are going to be taxed. And I'm not saying that this is like morally correct or whatever. I'm saying that this is what the marginal tax system does. The more you make, the more you pay. But it is scaled so that earning more money will never, ever cause you to go into a new tax bracket that in the end causes you to lose take home money. So earning more money always, 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 always results in additional take home value. So if you have some chunk of money, let's say that I draw a little chart here, right? A little bar chart that represents all of the money that you make and this is money earned from income and we'll talk about like the difference between income and uh capital gains which are two slight sorry two very different things and they are taxed very very differently uh but the way that the marginal tax system works is that let's say uh that this is you making zero dollars right and then up here uh, let's say that you are in a situation where you make $85,000 a year, which is pretty good for city living. Like this, you wouldn't be uh, struggling if you were making that much money and you didn't have a lot of debt. Like if you're making this much money and you have no student loans, you're probably doing all right. Um, the way that the marginal tax system works is that, and I'll give you all these numbers. I'm going to post these links to classroom because we'll need these to do an assignment. From zero to $9,700, and I guess this isn't going to be scaled the greatest. No, that's about right. From zero to $9,700, you are going to pay a certain amount of taxes. And then the next tax bracket up covers all of your money from $97,000. Am I sharing my whiteboard? Do you all see me writing right now? Or am I sharing the wrong screen and being like dumb about this? No, we can see it. No, okay. yeah, we can see it. Okay. And then from $9,700 to about $40,000 you will pay a different tax rate. And then from $40,000 all the way up to $85,000, that is where you will pay again a different rate. So in this first chunk on your first uh, $10,000, which like if you're a part-time working uh, high school um, student, I believe all of your money probably falls into this first tax bracket. If you're making less than $10,000, the federal income tax rate here is 10%. Now what you pay is gonna be a little bit higher because you also have state income tax to pay, uh, but this is just federal to keep these calculations simple, right? And then up next from 9,700 to $40,000 on that income, you pay 12%. And then from 40,000 to $85,000 on that amount, there you're paying the normal tax rate, which is about 22%. So on this first chunk of money that you make, you are only going to pay a very small fraction of it back to the feds in order to pay for the cost of you being a citizen, I guess. I think of it this way, childhood's a free trial. Now you have to pay for your subscription to be an American. Then the next tax bracket is a little bit higher. You're gonna take a slightly bigger cut of this next chunk of money. Do, 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 right there. And then once you get up to this bracket of 40,000 to 85,000, where you're living relatively comfortably, this is taxed at 22%, which is almost 
almost double that previous margin. And so if this is your total amount of money that you take home, this first chunk is barely taxed at all. And then the next chunk is taxed more. And then the next chunk is taxed more. Now, the reason why it's done this way is that there is no case in which earning more money will cause you to lose money because just because you go above $40,000, that doesn't mean that this 22% tax rate applies to everything. It does not go backwards and retroactively take more of your low income. Everybody in the world with income has their first $9,700 taxed at 10%, even Bill Gates. Bill Gates' first $10,000 that he earns every year is only taxed at 10%. And then as that goes up and up and up, he gets taxed more and more and more. And just so you know, the final tax bracket is uh, half a million dollars and above. And even that is 37%. That is the final tax bracket. All of the income after that is taxed at 37. Marianne, did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, are there any questions on this? And just so you know, this is um, income tax, income, which is to say uh, money made working. Yeah, so like for example, for people our age that have like that or have or had jobs like in the past, is that still like why like we barely get taxed on our stuff? Just yeah. because we make a low income? Yes, because all of your money, if, if you make less than ten thousand dollars a year, all of your money falls into this first income tax bracket where um you are only being taxed by about ten percent by the feds, and I'm not sure what the state is, I'd have to look that up. But as you earn more and more money and you cross these lines into higher brackets, it makes your take home uh, jump not as big as you thought, um, which, you know, it's a bummer. Yeah. But no matter what, like I said, this system is designed so that if you make more money, you take home more money. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, OK, yeah. And um, the other thing that I want to toss out there is the fact that um, this is just taxes on your income, right? But when you make money based off of investments, investments have their own marginal tax rate. So money made off of investments is called capital gains, and this will be our final item for today. Uh, so capital gains tax. So this is a uh, long-term capital gains. So I have a question about capital gains tax. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you know how you're saying it's from um like investing and stuff like that, and it's from a profit like your, like you said your capital gain. But if you're always reinvesting, it technically isn't that a loss because you don't have money on hand. It's reinvested into something. So if you just keep reinvesting and show no profit, you do you really need to pay tax on that? No, and the question that you just asked, if you had realized that in the 1970s, you would be a multi-billionaire tax lawyer right now because taking advantage of that structure of basically never cashing out your investments and always reinvesting them, always reinvesting them, always reinvesting them in order to avoid paying taxes, that is basically the standard now. That is how you get wild stories about major corporations like Apple or um General Electric, which is the company that also owns NBC and a bunch of other organizations, those companies have an effective tax rate, which we'll talk about effective tax rate tomorrow, of zero. They pay zero dollars because their accountants shift money around in such a way that technically there is no capital gains because they're not cashing it out. Instead, they are, quote unquote, putting it back into the company we're making it so that the money is not available as cash so that it cannot be taxed. It's like one of the most standardized tax evasion structures. But it's not illegal. No, if it was, you, to make it illegal, there would have to be changes to laws and it is standard practice kind of because it is legal. Okay. That's a good question, yeah. So um, in terms of money made from investments, um, and just so you know, this exact tax structure that I'm about to describe would not actually apply to our um, stock trading uh, project because those are called short-term gains. Sorry, short-term gains. Uh, that stuff is taxed like regular old income. So the money that you make off of your stocks, you are supposed to pay regular taxes on. So at the end of the year, when I did my taxes uh, this time around, I had a tax document from my um, investments 
uh, don't quote me on this. I had to look, I'd have to look at the value. I think it's 405A tells you what your taxes that you have to pay on your investments are. That stuff is tax like income. Capital gains tax for long-term gains. Uh, this is stuff like bonds or CDs or other things that kind of sit in the market for long periods of time and then give you access to the interest made. Uh, this stuff has its own tax bracket scheme. And here is the tax bracket scheme for capital gains. Um, let's say that you make half a million dollars in one year. Half a million dollars in um, invested money, right? Earned, or I, I won't say earned. I think earned money is money that you work for. This is something else. This is you had money and so you gave it to somebody else to make more money with. Nonetheless, uh, let's say that you make half a million dollars a year in terms of like your invested money. Somebody in this position would straight up be like, I don't know, maybe Michael Bloomberg is in this situation where Michael Bloomberg's account holdings are so big that he makes literally tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of interest a year. That is to say his bank accounts are so big that the extra money they generate is in the millions. Uh, but nonetheless, the capital gains tax bracket looks like this. So from zero to 40,000, about 40,000, the digits are slightly different, but I'm just rounding them off um, to make this easier, uh, which now that's not a good representation. 40,000 would be about there. Man. Uh, and then the next bracket is 40,000. All the way up to 434,000. And then from 434,000 up is the final tax bracket. Uh, here from zero to 40,000, this is taxed at 0%. If you are making money off of investments, that first 40,000 is untaxed. After that, the next tax bracket is 15%. So from $40,000 of interest gained to $434,000 of interest gained, the federal government is going to take away one eighth of it. And then from there, all the way up to infinity, from here up, this next bracket is taxed at 20%. So they take away one fifth of it. But in general, money made from investments is taxed at a much lower rate than money made working. It is taxed at a lower rate than income. So especially for those of y'all youngins, if you do end up with a chunk of money to invest, investing money is one of the wisest things you can do with it. It is a good way to generate additional income and for uh, specific long-term investments, that first $40,000 of it may go untaxed by the federal government. Um, and I believe that it is taxed by the state, but once again, it is taxed at a lower rate than money earned working. Uh, nonetheless, I said since I went over time yesterday that I would cut it short today, we'll stop here. Y'all have a nice long break. And when we come in tomorrow, we are going to bust open Excel and we are going to take a look at how you can take different income situations, figure out how much money you'll be paying on taxes. And again, it's only to the feds just because adding in the state calculation makes it more complicated. Uh, and tomorrow we'll calculate effective tax rate. So how much money are you actually going to end up paying in taxes by percent? So instead of using all of these brackets and all of these different digits, how can we take that and boil it down into one, per one single percentage value? Y'all have a nice day. And if you make any manipulations to your portfolios, just keep track of it in your Excel sheet. And I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, have a nice day. You too.